Boy, I am glad to be with you guys today. So much ground to cover. Thank you for joining me. Um, received a new book in the mail yesterday. This is amazing, folks. My life has been so blessed. I told you the other day about this review article that uh, came out, Anti-Parasitic and Antifungal Medicines for Targeting Cancer Cells, Literature Review and Case Studies, by two physicians, uh, Fred Guilford and Simon Yu. So uh, I'm getting my uh, teeth cleaned yesterday at the dentist, and my cell phone rings, and they're both out of the room, the hygienist and the dentist. And uh, so I answer my phone, and it's Simon Yu. Dr. Yu. And he said, uh, have you read the book yet? And I said, Simon, I just got it yesterday. And he said, okay, well, read it. Let me know what you think. Uh, cancer, Lyme disease, and chronic cancers. This is a different kind of a medical doctor. Uh, I've lectured at his symposiums out in John St. Louis. I think he's in St. Louis. Um, so I'm looking over this book last night. And the first thing I do with any book, when I get a book, I go to mycotoxins, no matter what the topic of the book, migraine headaches, menstrual irregularities, testicular pain. I, if it doesn't say mycotoxins in it, I just put it down. This one is kind of interesting. So I go to the back, and I haven't called him yet. I'm going to call him tonight, and he's probably listening right now. I want him to know how much I appreciate this. Um, I was honored in 2016, 2015, something like that. So mycotoxins... And it says, mycotoxin-related human illness, page 187. Okay, before I buy this book, which he sent me kindly, I want to read it. <clears throat> Article, Fungus, Molds, and Mycotoxins, the International Mycotoxin Summit, held in Dallas, Texas in 2016. So I'm reading about this, and I think, gee, I kind of remember that. <clears throat> In 2016, the International Summit on Mycotoxin Treatment was held in Dallas, Texas. The conference covered a broad spectrum of mycotoxin-related illnesses and treatment plans. I went there to refresh my knowledge on mycotoxin-related health illnesses. Among many excellent speakers at the Mycotoxin Treatments Conference was Doug Kaufman, whose lecture, The Role of Fungal Mycotoxins in Cancer, was outstanding. A direct, to the point, and relevant lecture for why we are getting so sick. Highlights include American Cancer Society defines fungal mycotoxins as genotoxic carcinogens. What? The American Cancer has defined mycotoxins as genotoxic, those that affect your DNA, your genes. Carcinogens? Fungal exposure has been greatly accelerated by sealing our homes. This was my lecture. Use of heating and air conditioning systems that encourage mold growth, erroneous uh, promotion of grains in the pyramid food charts over the last 70 years, increased al alcohol consumption, and the uncontrolled widespread use of antibiotics in humans and illnesses. I thought this was... Folks, there are so many books out there now. A friend of mine called and said he read about me in a book. Um, if you live long enough and stay with a topic long enough and do your homework, do your due diligence, um, you'll get your name in books. I mean, that just, I can't wait. I'm going to call him tonight and just thank him. But his paper on anti, folks, that which kills a parasite, a worm, also kills fungus. So the headline didn't shock me, anti-parasitic and anti-fungal medications targeting cancer cells. Doesn't shock me at all. We now know that itraconazole or sporinox, we know that, uh, oh gosh, there's so many of them, that uh, Lamisil, uh, we know that nystatin, we know that griseofulvin, we know that uh, thiabendazole, these are all antifungal drugs that are targeting, are targeting cancer cells. I, I'm lost as to why the medical community doesn't get it. So let me come off my high throne. I was just so high when I read that. It's so nice to see your work recognized. I remember that conference. There were doctors... Uh, from all over the United States, and a couple of them that were there internationally. And I was the keynote speaker. John, you went to that, didn't you? The, uh, the one here in Dallas, I was the keynote speaker. I spoke at dinner. Yeah. 
Yeah, it was, uh, I didn't know it was going to be such a big deal. It was a big deal, and I'm honored to have spoken there. Um, folks, I want to go through a, a few things, mistakes from last time. Uh, Kathy, I hope you're listening now. Any advice for my 14-year-old uh, with PCOS, polycystic ovarian disease? And I said, look, fungi are endocrine disruptors. Do you remember? It was 30 seconds until 4 o'clock on Tuesday. Think endocrine disruption. <clears throat> and that's the proper answer. But I want to go a step further with regard to these linoleic acids, uh, omega-6 fatty acids, as opposed to, you know, the uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Um, these linoleic acids would be of so much benefit to this little girl, um, Kathy. And uh, please go online, <clears throat> look them up, and uh, study them because they're hormone adjusters. They're actually linoleic acids kill fungus. Um, so omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, and the, the one I would like you to study, Kathy, is called um, evening primrose oil. I think it's a GLA, a gamma linoleic acid. <laughs> we have a wasp in here, right? And so the wasp patrol, uh, Cray is coming through with his uh, fly swatter. You don't, I, I think it's up in the attic, some wasp bin or something, but we called the bug guy and he'll be, yeah, did you, you didn't get stung, did you? Because that's workman's comp. I mean, huge paycheck. <laughs> Gathering them and holding them in your arm. I remember in, uh, in Vietnam, um, I knew that the female Anopheles mosquito we had to study this, you know, uh, bit you, and you could get malaria from that bite. And I'm telling you, there were some nights when it's pouring rain and it's 100 degrees and it's sticky and you're miserable, and we're sleeping by a, a, a lake bed somewhere, and I'm just wanting to catch those mosquitoes and roll up my sleeve and hold them on me. Surely malaria has to be better than what I was going through there. And I did end up with malaria. Um, and that's a whole other story. I'll fill you in someday on that, but I, you get really sick. The doctor, who is my friend in San Diego, his name is Tom Glynn. He was an anesthesiologist, and I worked in the OR, in the operating room in anesthesia. And he told me once he didn't recognize me uh, when I had malaria because he said, you were so thin, if you stuck your tongue out and turned sideways, you look like a zipper. And I mean, you lose, I was probably 105 pounds. Uh, you get so, so sick with that disease. So, Kathy, I digress. Um, evening primrose oil. Please study that for your 14-year-old daughter. Um, we also had, I think it was Roy, my friend Roy, who asked a lot of questions. Thank you, Roy. You asked about depression, anxiety, et cetera, because you were in a chat room talking about that. And could there be any help uh, for... Uh, these neurological conditions with fungus. I want to quote you, and I made you a copy of this. I made me a copy of it to read you. Can fungus induce depression or brain disorders? In 2001, researchers tested five commonly used antidepressant drugs, SSRIs, probably Prozac, Zoloft, and a few others, against Aspergillus fungi. Now, folks, what would lead researchers to study SSRIs with aspergillus, a very, very common mold, with the exception of candida, which is a yeast. Uh, yeast is a single-celled fungus. The others are multi-cell. So um, what would lead researchers to test five of these commonly used antidepressants, selective SSRIs, they're called, against aspergillus mold? I mean, who would think that antidepressants would kill it? But guess what? Their findings were published in the American Journal of Antimicrobial Therapy. Their research findings, the five SSRIs, I'm quoting them, tested in this study displayed different potencies with respect to both antifungal killing and lag of fungal regrowth. All five had antifungal properties. And I got to ask myself, Roy, and all you folks watching right now, thank you for joining me. Is depression a fungal disease? I mean, who was it? It was... Uh, here it is, ha 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 and I didn't set that up this way. <clears throat> Missing Diagnosis. Here, John, do you have the camera on me? This book is called The Missing Diagnosis. It's written by a guy I spoke with many years ago, Orion Truss, he's a medical doctor. They may say you're neurotic, but do you experience depression, anxiety? Roy, isn't that what we're talking about? Irritability, 
Uh, bloating, diarrhea, constipation, stomach problems, chemical odor problems, headaches, migraines, uh, lethargy. And this book is about fungus. And it was 1986, or when was this book? The Missing Diagnosis, 1983. Man, I was young back then. One of my heroes, Billy Crook, Dr. Bill Crook, the Yeast Connection, Orion Trust. Um, these amazing doctors knew decades ago the etiology of depression, in many cases, not all, Roy, but if I went into a chat room dealing with anxiety, nervousness, rapid pulse, I had these things when I got back from Vietnam. I told you I couldn't ride an elevator up to the ninth floor of the, the hospital that we worked in because my heart would just beat out of its chamber. Folks, when you have a fungus on board, the rules change. And I want to read you something that I think is kind of neat. Um, you know I subscribe to many of these medical newsletters. Medscape is a good one. And Medscape wrote this. I just want you to be the diagnostician, okay? You get to make the call. I randomly pulled out Medscape. You know, it'll go on and do an article, and they'll have 10 doctors join in and talk. And I made a copy of some of the comments on this. Uh, Medscape, worsening abdominal pain and bloating in a 30-year-old woman. 30-year-old woman uh, presents with recurrent abdominal pain and loose stools. She states that she has been uh, experiencing these symptoms since adolescence, since she was a little girl, with periods of improvement worsening over the years. Over the past year, her symptoms have been recurring more frequently with greater severity. For the last six months, she has been bothered by bloating. The bloating seems to be linked to food intake. Now listen to her diet. She denied waking up at night. Oh, ever, uh, this was interesting. When questioned about the abdominal pain, she described it as a six, with the 10 being the worst. Acute worsening occurs immediately before she goes to the bathroom, right? With significant improvement after she goes to the bathroom. She's had this pain at least once every week for the past six months. The patient loose stools approximately a third of the time, okay? She denied waking up at night to have to go to the bathroom, no blood in her stool, anything like that. Uh, she has no history of nausea, vomiting, or change of weight. I'm reading this history because, as you guys know, for 20-plus years, I worked clinically with doctors. And I would be the one to go in and shake this woman's hand and say, Hi, I'm Doug. Um, the doctors haven't been able to help you with anything. Maybe I can. And they'd just say, Oh, I hope you can. I've been to so many people. Okay. No relationship was found between her symptoms and her diet. Her diet includes milk products, spicy foods, alcohol, and processed meats. She denies excessive hunger or anorexia symptoms. Okay. This blew me away. Two, today, 205 doctors and nurses joined in on this. You kind of get your finger on the pulse of what these doctors are thinking when you read something like this. Okay, what's your take after knowing Doug Kaufman? Antibiotic-induced... Uh, bowel problems, antibiotic-induced bloating. Folks, what makes bread rise? Could that same yeast catalytic reaction make people rise? I wrote a whole book on this, uh, The Fungus Link to Weight Gain. I mean, it's all about fermentation in our body, you know, yeast fermentation in our body making us bloat. But I didn't see the word yeast. I tried to read all of them. But let me read you some of what I saw. Now remember, these are doctors and nurses that if you had this problem, uh, you'll be seen by these people. They're all good people. They're all good people, but I want you to go back to the fact that they were taught in their medical training by drug companies. Laboratory work, because labor laboratory work always reflexes drugs. Doesn't always, but most of the time. Registered nurse three hours ago, uh, recommend full food intolerance testing. Kind of novel. 50, 45 years ago, I would have recommended that too. Here's internal medicine doctor, most likely diagnosis is irritable bowel. Here's OBGYN, need to do ultrasound and endoscopy. Here's general practice doctor. <clears throat> uh, why not do uh, calprotectin of the stool, uh, a, a, a test, uh, a white blood cell test in the stool. Uh, here's a medical student irritable bowel syndrome, here's a surgeon, ulcerative colitis is possible, here's a pediatrician, IBS suggests colonoscopy. Um, here is a public community health physician, colonoscopy and ultrasound, probably IBS. 
Next doctor, family medicine, irritable bowel, anesthesiologist, likely IBS, irritable bowel with suggested colonoscopy. General practice doctor, impression, irritable bowel, colonoscopy to rule out cancer. Here's a registered nurse. Why would one not consider a colonoscopy? Here's a general practitioner, irritable bowel syndrome. A nurse, as part of a workup, a pelvic ultrasound, and I got to thinking of that. Pelvic ultrasound on a 30-year-old woman. Okay, a uh, woman. Kind of makes sense. I mean, you know, when there's non-specific pain and bloating, who knows? Could this be fungus, or I mean cancer, in that area? Um, then it got to this. Now, here's, here's somebody named NCU, other healthcare provider. Cut out dairy products except kefir or Greek yogurt. Avoid yeast breads, something. Add cinnamon to everything. Quit drinking, smoking, or taking all your drugs. I'm wondering, is this a doctor? When it says C NCU, it's like NIC, like, like neonatal ICU. But I don't think so based on this. Kind of logical. I don't agree with all of it, but it's kind of logical. Walk your dog. Go around the house. Take the stairs. Add a good probiotic. Eliminate eggs, I don't know why, for a while. Corn, wheat, whole wheat, beans. Add Irish oatmeal. Um, avoid red meat. You have to remember they're in medicine. Avoid fresh salads. Uh, go for very cooked, plain vegetables. Uh, soup with a little sea salt, sauerkraut, perhaps a dietary enzyme. Add foods back one at a time. It works. I am a nine-year breast cancer patient. Then I got it. Then I got it. Here's someone who was following tradition, probably, in the medical field and realized chemo and radiation, my only options, and surgery, if you're in the medical field um, and you listen to your doctors, chemo, radiation, and uh, surgery are the only three options. Here's somebody that's exercising. Here's somebody that's taking good probiotic. Here's somebody that, that is talking about cutting out whole wheat. I mean, logic started applying. It blew me away. And I hope this 30-year-old woman has access to reading some of this. Here's another RN. Uh, thanks, whoever this is. I'm going to try the kimchi. Okay, good. Uh, free range, American, humane, uh, chicken turkey, certified chicken hot dogs, nestled inside Rudy's organic hot dog bun. Kimchi, kimchi seems to be a great immune system booster. I'm looking at the hundreds of doctors reading this. Are they going tisk, tisk, tisk? Or are they saying, wow, I might recommend that to my patients? Here's a general practitioner of colonoscopy. Uh, here's a uh, uh, psychiatrist, uh, Giardia. Here's a, another uh, general practitioner, most likely IBS, irritable bowel. Another general could be a irritable bowel. Uh, RN, rule out ovarian cancer. That's what I thought too. Okay. Uh, Premenstrual syndrome, this is a doctor. Uh, IBS, possibly celiac. Another doctor, irritable bowel. Another doctor, irritable bowel. Another doctor, irritable bowel. Uh, Dr. Ann, irritable bowel, irritable bowel. This is interesting. Uh, Marie, very good article. Just had a friend with the same symptoms as waiting to have a colonoscopy. The doctor says stress. Can you have stress in your colon? I guess. They're going to do a colonoscopy and they consider stress the problem. But I kind of like ruling out. Folks, this is where I think. We talked the other day about colonoscopy. I, I've never had one. Um, but I'm not opposed to it. As a matter of fact, if there were blood in my stool, I'd probably have a colonoscopy. Um, but it's so fascinating to me. Here's another doctor. Uh, we Look at this. Now, I don't know who I'm going to tell you this guy's name. No, I can't do that. This is a doctor who blew me away. Listen to this. We place so little emphasis on diet in these types of cases, it amazes me. Thank you. Logic enters. IBS, colonoscopy, drugs. Burr, 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 burr. Um, so that opened my eyes. That really assisted me in better understanding. And these people, many of them, are gastroenterologists. Gastroenterologists who don't realize, folks, that after you masticate, 
and swallow that whatever you chewed up becomes part of your gut. Wow. Oh, there. <laughs> Thanks, John. You working out today? Oh, yeah. I did 800 today in the sun. It's 101 out there. Wow. A little warm. A little warm. Oh. Um, so that was really an eye opener for me. Really an eye opener for me. Uh, let's see. Okay, I wanted to. Before I answer your questions, John said they're really good questions. By the way, we, we've gone up 40% in our viewers of this show. The TV show has been a hit. Apparently, my lectures have, have been a hit. Social media is something, I'm an old guy. You know, this is kind of new to me. But it was something I wanted to dig into because whereas my audience on television is, is a mature audience, um, there's 30-year-old women who have bloating and problems in the gut and no doctor, no doctor said, I wonder if she's been on antibiotics, because they can do that. Not one. Test. Uh, colonoscopies. You know, get her into some invasive procedure. I'm not so sure if I had that training. No, I'm sure if I had that training, I'd be saying the same thing. I would be saying exactly the same thing. You see, I think sit this young woman down and do what I would have done in the 1980s. Hey, you know what, Linda? Have you been healthy your whole life? Yeah. Um, ever have antibiotics? Yeah, you know, but I was seven, eight years old, never had any problems since, and it's only been, Doug, the past six months that I'm not, well, look, you know, stand sideways. By the way, she's five foot six, weighs 160 pounds. Um, and, uh, you know, do you notice, can I ask you a question? Antibiotics could have started all this back when you were seven or eight years old. Do you drink alcohol? Yeah, it notes on her chart. Uh, she drinks alcohol. Do you notice that it's worse after, well, now that you come to say, Doug, it's not, you know, it probably goes up to a six. I'll go out with my girlfriends and we'll have a drink, or my husband will have a drink. Um, and the next morning, it seems to be kind of bad. Why? Alcohol is good for your heart, my doctor says. Um, there are none of those questions. This is why I want you guys to consider ACIM and, uh, <laughs> I didn't shut my phone off. Um, John, can you hit that for me? Um, this is why I want you guys to consider the Academy of Complementary and Integrative Medicine and become a counselor in a doctor's office. It's just so I lay it up there. Oh, and because I'm obviously barefoot, who was that? Oh, my buddy, okay. Um, By the way, we have the smartest audience in America also. Isn't that true? Did you guys hear what John just said? We've noticed this on television. We have picked it up incredibly thanks to a great research done by our uh, social media guys who do all this. We have a really smart audience. You guys blow me away. You really do, and I'm not just saying that. Um, this, you're intense, you're smart, and you're here for one reason, you're hungry. Either you have the problem, or you have a loved one who has the problem, your kids, your grandkids. Um, it's just so exciting. Linda, I'm not gonna take long with you. This is gonna take me 20 minutes. Would you mind if I talk to you about a diet? Well, Doug, you see I'm eating whole grains, I eat meat, my doctor says meat's killing me. I don't agree with him on that. I think there are two kinds of meats, and I'd like you to start buying Ted Slankers, grass-fed meat. Mm -mm. Um, and I wouldn't expound on that, but there's no antibiotics, no hormones, no growth hormones in that meat, and I don't think that's gonna hurt you. My concern isn't so much the meat that your doctors are worried about. My concern is the wine that your doctors tell you is good for your heart, okay? But everybody drinks wine for two weeks. We're going to stop it. I'm going to see you again in two weeks. Then I'm going to ask you to go to a health food store. I'm going to ask you to get some psyllium, P-S-Y-L-L-I-U-M. I typed this all out. I used to have a word processor uh, before the computer came along <clears throat> in the 1980s. And I want you to go get some psyllium. I want you to get a scoop of that, shake it up in a glass of water, screw the lid on tight, shoot it down, chase it with a glass of water right before you go to bed in the evening. 
Then I want you to get Dr. O'Hara's probiotics, okay? These are living organisms, not dead powder, that you reconstitute with water. Um, those are good probiotics also. But I want you to take the living probiotic, a couple of them, a couple times a day. All of this, by the way, uh, when we exit, one of the doctors, there were three of them there, would come in and go over this with me. Okay, okay, I like that, I like that, okay, I'll do it. So, Linda, I'm gonna see you in two weeks. Uh, you're just telling me to change my diet and take a couple supplements, caprylic acid and a probiotic and psyllium? Yeah, that's all we're gonna do. And I gotta tell you guys, I lived this. Two weeks, very often there were tears in the waiting room. They could not, they were early to see me. They could not believe it. I can't believe this. I've lost, look, you know, my pants, my shirt doesn't fit. I've lost 11 pounds in two weeks. Yeah, I know. How's the bloating? Gone. How about the tummy? Bowels are working regularly. Everything went away. Are you telling me that I've been to seven doctors for this? I love what that one doctor said. So I'm going to tell you again what he said, and then we'll move on to your questions. We place so little emphasis on diet in these types of cases, it amazes me. Amen, theta compli, done. We place so little emphasis. Can you imagine how these other doctors thought, well, <laughs> she needs drugs and tests. Okay, now you know where I come from. Can I just say before we go, antifungal properties of common drugs, aspirin's antifungal, we talked Thursday, tamoxifen's antifungal, gout medicines, colchicine, antifungal, chemotherapy's antifungal, depression medicines, SSRIs are antifungal, AIDS medications are antifungal, dandruff medication is antifungal, tissue rejection drugs are antifungal, calcium channel blockers are antifungal, glitazone for diabetes is antifungal, most vitamins and minerals are antifungal. Psyllium has antifungal properties. Amino acids are antifungal. Fatty acids are antifungal. Many components of fresh fruit and vegetables are antifungal. Zinc kills fungus. Garlic kills fungus. Citrus seeds kill fungus. Essential oils kill fungus. Probiotics inhibit fungal proliferation. So now you know. Now you know why when you take your daily multiple and when you take your omega-3 fatty acid, I know it's good for the heart. That's what all the studies say. Why do you suppose this form of oil is good for your heart? Thank you. It has antifungal properties. Okay, now, on to your questions. Thank you so much for them. I'm going to try and keep organized out here. I'm not real good at organization. You should see my sock drawer. Okay, uh, Roy, just shared this to an anxiety group. Could you say a few words about mold and anxiety? There you go, Roy. I hope that helps. Um, Doug, uh, Rebecca uh, from Facebook, this is off track a little, but wondering how fungus affects the thyroid, having so much trouble with it, I can't get it regulated with foods. Okay, if I had hyper or hypothyroid, um, I would say to my doctor, look, Doug keeps showing us these books. This book, <clears throat> Principles and Practice of Clinical Mycology. This book expounds on all the places fungus can grow. If you're new to this forum, I just want to read you. Fungal disease of the bone and joint, fungal diseases of the cardiovascular system, fungal meningitis, the coverings of the uh, uh, nerves, the brain and, nerve and spinal cord, mycosis, fungus causing mass lesions in your central, fungus central nervous system, fungus causes sores that don't heal. Gee, I thought cancer caused sores that don't heal. Fungal diseases in dermatology. Thank you, sir. Uh, fungal infections of the ear, nose, and throat. Fungus and disseminated fungal infections in the blood. Fungal infections of the GI, gastrointestinal tract. Fungal diseases in the genitourinary system and those including fungal prostatitis. Not rare, although we're told it. Fungal infections of the kidney and those associated with kidney failure. Yeah, fungus can kill you. 
Fungal disease of the eye. We did a story on that today. Fungal infections of the respiratory tract. What this book, the bottom line, I think this was the book that I quote in some of my studies. Experts, these are all doctors at major universities, have published that fungi, the 300 that we now know can parasitize we humans, can grow in any tissue in the human body except the teeth. Any tissue. See you, George. Have a good one. Oh, tell Brittany and her parents hello for me. Okay, see you, Craig. Bye-bye. Um, uh, such wonderful kids. Uh, when they graduate from film school, which costs a lot of money and I guess takes a couple of years, we hire them on. Many of them we've had in here as brand new. This is their first job. And they are amazing. The brains on these kids, they have no fear editing, filming, lighting, makeup. I mean, they have absolutely no fear. They make this old guy look fair on TV. So that's why we keep him around. Fungus can grow in any tissue in the human body except the teeth. So, Rebecca, what I want you to understand is thyroid and parathyroid, um, fungi are endocrine disruptors. That's an endocrine gland. They can get into them and then dysregulate the hormones they're supposed to be making. So you're hot when it's cold and you're cold when it's hot and you put on a lot of weight or you weigh, you know, 80 pounds soaking wet. Um, get the thyroid regulated. There are friends of mine who are physicians who put most of their patients on thyroid medication. Um, I probably wouldn't do that, but but they do, and they get, sometimes they get some pretty good results with it. I'm not advocating that. I'm asking you, if I suspected, look at your history, right? Take the spore score in my woman's book, or, or take the fungal test in any of my books. Been on lots of antibiotics in your life, Rebecca? Um, did you ever sleep in a, in a basement? You know. Um, has your home ever leaked? Has the bas bathtub or toilet ever overflowed? Um, you know, there, there's just so many, when you get out of a shower or a bath, do you itch just horribly? Fungi love to grow on skin and heat activates them. There are just so many things when you were, <laughs> I'll answer this one yes for you so you don't have to answer it. When you were in your 20s, did you drink too much alcohol? <clears throat> are you kidding me? Um, all of these things expose us to mycotoxins. Do you love corn or did you? Corn chips, uh, peanuts, peanut butter. And we now know that our wheat supply, so whole wheat, half wheat, quarter wheat, whatever we're eating, is often impregnated here in America. We think this is a Zimbabwe problem. Folks, it's a California, Texas, Florida, you know, problem. Um, by the way, before I finish this sidebar, boy, did we dodge a bullet. I saw on Facebook, John, someone did this drawing where they had the storm coming out of the Bahamas, headed toward Florida, and then the hand of God right here, and then the storm went north. And whoever drew that is genius, is genius. Also, I was looking on a website. I have so many friends that you know asked me to go to their website and look at it. Look at what this one guy said, and I think this sums it up pretty well. This is Mike Wells. Thanks, Mike. Charging $50 for a $6 uh, case of water during a hurricane is price gouging. Yet charging $700 for a $5 vial of insulin is health care. I got to tell you, if, if I and my family were thirsty, I'd pay 50 bucks. I wouldn't smack the guy. Um, Nobody smacks a pharmacy that charges that kind of money for insulin. I mean, it just strikes me. Healthcare, we need so much help, help in the healthcare world. So, Rebecca, I'd ask my doctor if I could get three days of, if, especially if you feel that mold is a problem, three days of Diflucan, 150 milligram. And I'd take one of them every other day for a week and I'd follow the Kaufman One program, and I'd see at the end of 10 days, is this better? How are you feeling? You say you can't seem to uh, get rid of it with foods. Um, I'd go so far, look, I'm way out in right field. 
I'm the kind of guy who if I had a lump growing on my neck or if I had a thyroid problem that was keeping me up at night and really scaring me because the doctors didn't know what to do, I'd probably stop eating for a week. Let's see if food's tied into this. Um, I drink only water, you know, uh, and see how I was doing in a week. But I don't think you have to do that. For a couple of weeks, for the first week, load with Diflucan. All it does is kill fungus and it'll kill it in the thyroid. Uh, and then after three Diflucan, just stay on the diet and see if in a week or two you're not feeling much, much better. We did not cure fungal thyroiditis, although that's probably what it was. What we did was whetted your appetite, piqued your interest. Wow. You know, Doug, for two or three days after that Diflucan, I felt like myself when I was younger. Okay, more of the same should consistently help you get better and better and better. The one thing I've learned in my almost 50 years in this field is, uh, in bacteriology, you learn very quickly, those of you who have gone through it, you learn that germs resist treatment. That's why there's so many antibiotics. Well, your fever went down on that penicillin, but now it's not down, so I'm going to switch cillins a little bit. And uh, these germs outsmart our medication. Instead of, whoa, they're killing me with that medicine, they're in little hot tubs, you know, sucking on their thumbs, living off the antibiotics coming in. My point is, move around the antifungals. Uh, there are so many of them. You heard me talk on it today. Um, move them around. Every week or two, change out that one and start another new one. Okay, sorry, John, I'm backing up great here. Yeah, good. Okay, I hope that helps. Think fungus. Remember what a FUPO is? A FUPO head? Are you guys FUPO heads? Fungus until proven otherwise. FUPO. Um, okay, so uh, Doug, thank you for sharing your knowledge. Uh, this is from Barbara and understand about knowing the cause of so many health issues. How can I improve interstitial lung disease without a transplant? Wow, oh, such a good question. I don't know where you are, but at that 2000, I thought about this, John. If that was the meeting, I've been so blessed to speak to so many of these doctors. If that was the meeting, it was 2016 that I met Dr. Soraya and Bennett Luke, dear, dear man. Um, well, I knew Bennett for 20 years before, but I met uh, a doctor he was working with. He was a pulmonary specialist. He's the doctor that after uh, the seminar called me and said, wow, I was totally blown away, totally blown away. So he said, Doug, I'm suspicious, and this is going to answer your question. I'm suspicious I do a lot of bronchoscopies where I put the tube into the lungs instead of just randomly doing what 90% of doctors do. Take this antibiotic next, take this antibiotic next, take this in. He said, I'm tired of that. I want to see what's down there. So he pulled it up and he said, gosh, 70, 80 percent of the time, he's now done hundreds of these looking. He wasn't in the past. Thanks to that meeting in 2016, he is now looking for fungus. And he said 70 to 80 or more percent of the time, interstitial or pulmonary uh, malfunctions occur because of yeast and fungus. Um, so, Barb, if I had interstitial lung disease, um, I'd talk to my pulmonologist about doing a bronchoscopy with the intent, <laughs> you gotta say the F word in there, fungus. I want you to look for aspergillus and foma and candida and, you know, I want you to look for the 12 most common fungi. That's what this doctor is now doing on his patients. It blew him away. He'd been in practice 25 years, and it blew him away that 70 to four out of five that he was handing an antibiotic to. And he's not that kind of guy. This guy believes in uh, Ayurvedic medicine, neem, um, curcumin. You know, he was giving his patients these natural things to see if that could kill the bacteria or the fungus. So this guy's way above others. Um, but most doctors, if they do a bronchoscopy, um, they're looking for bacteria. And they don't know the significance. You see, guys, I'm, I'm going to be that doctor, my doctor hat on now. Well, I learned before college 
that man had yeast in his gut and bacteria in his, no, I didn't. Uh, but that's probably what this doctor is saying because he's twice my IQ. <clears throat> so isn't it normal to have candida and have aspergillus? I mean, you just inhale it in your bathroom if your bathroom's overrun. Isn't it normal to have candida and aspergillus and all these various fo forms of mold in your body? Pathogenic mold means just that. It's a pathogen. It can induce human disease. I would bet you, you know, you have an 80% chance, Barb, of a doctor doing a bronchoscopy and saying, whoa, look at these 14 strains of fungus you have in your lungs. And Barb, I looked up last night on, my, on the internet, <clears throat> I looked up 11 of them. These are bad guys. Now, Barb, we're gonna go a little bit different. I'm gonna put you on Sporinox for a couple of weeks, then I'm gonna put you on ketoconazole for a couple of weeks, then we're gonna try itraconazole, antifungal drugs, two weeks at a time. I don't know this guy, but I've heard about him. His name's Kaufman. He has a diet that's popular. It kills, or it starves fungus. So why don't you go on his diet? Do you see where I'm going with this? You know the downside to interstitial lung disease. Not pretty. Um, you have to study this as though your life depends on it. Every one of you. Every one of you. It is not incumbent on your doctor to go back and pay another $500,000 to a medical school and learn about fungus. I think most of them blew it. It's now incumbent upon us to dust ourselves off to say, I am, I can afford a $200, $300 computer. I'm gonna study. There's a lot of bad out there in the World Wide Web, but there's a lot of life-saving data out there on the World Wide Web. My goal in offering you this couple hours, two and a half hours a week, is to try and get your mind thinking. Type in, go to pubmed.gov. When you get a grant to publish a research paper, the government pays for it, their only request is put the paper on pubmed.org or .gov, <clears throat> PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D, Barb, go to PubMed, type in interstitial fungus. Now, I'll probably say interstitial cystitis or interstitial other tissue. You can go further, interstitial pulmonary fungus, and watch what happens. These are remote research papers sometimes. Saudi Arabia, you know, Abu Dhabi. You can't believe where they come from, but they're so relevant. In America, we tend to say, oh, well, if it wasn't published in the US, it's not valid. Guys, I gotta tell you what the insiders are saying. If it is published in the US, sometimes it's valueless because we happen to take money from the companies that want a favorable outcome sometimes. That's cheating, and yet it's going in medical journals. So sometimes when articles come from outside of the U.S., they're so innocent, and to read them just blows my mind. They're all in English on pubmed.gov. I can plant that seed, Barb, but I can't make you study this. But I know the downside five years, ten years from now with interstitial lung disease. I saw it. I saw it when I was, you know, at the hospitals. Um, can you turn it around? I don't know. If fungus is growing throughout there, you're gonna get worsening of your uh, interstitial disease. So, man, roll up your sleeves, go to work. You got me here two and a half hours a week. Okay, um, Julie says, I was prescribed Diflucan and Sporinox. Can I take these together? Wow, are they safe? <laughs> what types of side effects would I expect? Uh, I am not one to take prescription meds. You're like a little girl who just got a doll. Can I play with it? I've never had a doll. I mean, th there's so many questions I have. You mean a doctor prescribed these for you and didn't tell you how to take them? I wonder what milligram strength they are. We had, you're right, we have the smartest audience in the world. Julie got it. Yeah. Ah, uh, this is, uh, John, you're so right. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so Diflucan was the first antifungal AIDS drug to hit the market in the late 1970s, early 1980s. I studied it a little bit, <clears throat> and thinking back then, 
in the 70s, gosh, everything must be due to fungus. When I began seeing these doctors' patients, <clears throat> I asked, I didn't know what Spornox was then, I asked the doctors if I could, um, if they would write a prescription for diclucan for these people. I knew it killed in the thyroid and in the brain and in the earlobe and, you know, I'll put them on the diet. It was pretty gaining popularity back then, but I need some help. And folks, I didn't have the nutrition background. It wasn't until David died, the doctor I was working with, when I said, holy cow, now where am I going to get these drugs? And I began taking courses with a doctor friend of mine in nutrition, in herbology. And they opened up, I mean, this teacher was so good, I forget her name, but, you know, we'd hang around class afterwards, and it was a long way, I'd drive an hour, um, and say, you know, we talked tonight about valerian root, we talked tonight about uva ursi, we talked tonight about cinnamon. Do these things have anti -fungal? Well, are you kidding? It's a plant. God put plants here to defeat the bacteria in the ground and the fungus and the viruses in our environment. And so we learned so much if every physician would have to go through a course or two in herbology, man, things would be much different today. But they shun, their organization shun courses in herbology. Go figure. So, uh, Diflucan is an antifungal medicine that gets into the bloodstream. Sporinox came on the market in the mid-1980s as competition to Diflucan, and yet Spornox was more of an anti-dermatophyte, a skin. So all of a sudden, nobody had toenail fungus in 1975. Then the whole world had it when Sporinox came out on the market. I'll never forget TV and, and radio uh, personalities talking about what is this with toenail fungus all of a sudden? Does everybody have it? It was kind of a joke. Um, but uh, Sporinox came out and Lamisil came out at the same time, two antifungal drugs that broke the blood-brain barrier and treated toenail fungus, jock itch, etc. <clears throat> um, so if the doctor, get, don't, do not take those two together, and he or she has probably told you that, um, because they both have some of the same properties. Taking two of them would probably be too much. The die-off that would ensue would probably be horrible. The fact that you got two systemic antifungal medications I would, now your question is, are they safe? All antifungal drugs, as far as I know, can induce hepatotoxicity. <clears throat> I've been talking, we did shows today, and I'm sorry, I've been talking all day. <clears throat> so, it couldn't have been that Vietnamese lunch. Mm -mm -mm. Did we have a good lunch today? <clears throat> um, I, I have never, in my career seen one elevated liver enzyme or one person complaining of liver toxicity after taking these drugs. I'm telling you the truth. And I have interviewed dozens of physicians who I introduce to these drugs and use them with tremendous results. We, all at, we ask all of them when they come on our set, have you ever seen an adverse reaction, hepato, liver toxicity? <clears throat> no, never seen one case and they're using lots of them. I don't know. I think they're safe, but that again would be a conversation with your doctor. What types of side effects would I expect? The number one side effect I saw with uh, either of these would be Herxheimer or a healing crisis. I took 200 milligrams of Diflucan. Oh, I feel horrible. As you pop fungal cells, they emit something called a mycotoxin. And there is an a fungal cell. There's probably millions of fungal cells that these kill. So they're emitting a poison back into your bloodstream. Uh, so go easy. First time, I don't take medications, but uh, back when I got back from Vietnam, I took uh, uh, Nizorol and I took Nystatin. And I'm the kind of guy that worries about me. Um, so I would break one of those little guys in half. Well, it says take 100 milligram, so I'd take a chip of that the first night. Well, it seemed to got away with it, and I'll take a half one. So tighter up on these is what I would do. I am not one to take prescriptive medicines. <clears throat> I think you'll find that without the diet, they're for naught. You can kill, but it'll regrow. You can kill, but it'll regrow. Especially if you're feeding it whole wheat and alcohol and antibiotics and corn and peanuts. 
So you've really got to adhere to the diet, the Kaufman diet, along with taking these. Good questions, Julie. Thank you. Most importantly, know this. <clears throat> this is a, a meeting with your doctor question, but I can kind of give you the ground rules because I, I know these so well. And I worked with so many doctors who use these antifungals. Um, so I hope that helps. Um, so uh, Tony says, Doug, love your show. Thank you. My husband has lost two toes to diabetes. Yeah, and half his foot to diabetes. Yeah, grandma had that too. Gangrenous tissue, no circulation. Has horrible fungus on his toes. How can I help him? Tony. Okay, can we get Tony's? Tony, send us your last name and your uh, mailing address. Let me send you a book that will change you and your husband's life. We wrote this book 2003 or 2004. It is still flying off the shelves. The Fungus Link to Diabetes. The truths, the research data that was published in that book, and I owe a great thanks to a guy named Dr. Dave Holland, who is out in, uh, in uh, El Paso, Texas, <clears throat> who really put that book together. Um, I want to send you this book, but I want you to raise your right hand. I promise, Doug, I'll have my husband read this, absorb it, and I will try with him the Kaufman diet. In that book, we call it the phase one. I'll try the first diet, uh, and I'll take the test. Folks, if I just, Tony, let me whet your appetite. When we study mice, we give them fungus to give them diabetes. What? Didn't any researcher go home and tell his wife, you're not going to believe this. I've been inoculating baflomycin and streptozotocin. These are antibiotics. Antibiotics are mycotoxins, fungal poisons. We've been giving these 2,000 mice uh, streptomycin or baflomycin, uh, and, and they all get diabetes in a year. I wonder, what, I wonder if that causes diabetes in humans. Isn't that the question you have? Why is it that our healthcare practitioners don't, and the guys who do the injection, probably make it 80,000 a year, holding a little mouse up, weep, weep, weep. What is this stuff? Well, it's called baflomycin. Wait a minute. That's an antibiotic. Yeah. And it says that excessive amounts can induce diabetes. Yeah, that's what we're doing to these mice. Does my mind work like yours? is that unbelievable, incomprehensible that our endocrinologists don't learn this in medical school? That's a seed I just planted, Tony. That's a little tiny bit of advice what's in this book. You'll be like my neighbor, um, like so many people have written me on that book. By page 20, your mouth will drop open. Epidemic that we have no handle on, you bet. As long as we make the recommendation, American Diabetes Association, eh, alcohol seems to be okay. Not. Alcohol is a mycotoxin. Just follow their dietary, whole wheat. Follow their dietary recommendations. And I don't mean to be chiding anyone. These are good and very smart people. They've dedicated their lives to try to help people. But what if your hypothesis is wrong? What if they don't know that in wheat sometimes, in corn, a lot of times, are these mycotoxins that can change the pancreas, that can break the beta cells, that can induce diabetes. Do you know what glitazones are, Tony? You probably do. Actos Navandia. These drugs kill fungus. What does that tell you? They're diabetes drugs. Wow. Good. So, Tony, get me your mailing address. I'm going to sign that book and get it out to you. John, I'm going to keep this, because we always get confused after the show. <clears throat> okay, so let me just write on it, diabetes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, address is uh, email us at live at knowthecause.com. Uh, okay, so uh, Kathy, my buddy Kathy, Hi, Doug and crew. By the way, it is so sweet of you guys. I try to go in. When I get home, I grab a quick bite, and I try and go in and answer as many questions as I can. 
and I love, hey, Doug from Iowa, hey, Doug from Colorado. Did you see the, hey, Doug from Greece, hey, Doug from Zimbabwe? I mean, it's just, it's very exciting. Uh, would like to purchase the woman's book and the new cookbook. How can I have them autographed by you? I want to encourage my Kaufman resources for my wellness coaching. <laughs> Kristen says, write in the notes area if they are order on the web and call. Okay, Kath, email me live at knowthecause.com with your last name, your mailing address, and I'm sending you two early Christmas gifts. Okay. Okay, and thank you for watching and thank you for your coaching, your wellness. They call it at ACIM a core wellness. And I, I'm so excited about this. You know, I didn't know what core wellness was when I got back from Vietnam. I went to work with an ear, nose, and throat doctor who wanted to start doing allergy testing. And I studied the immune system, and I, I knew a little bit about allergies. But he sent me all over the place uh, studying. And what he was most interested in me, you see, my background was in emergency medicine. And sometimes when you inject even a tiny amount of an antigen, ragweed, and you have a patient who is hypersensitive to ragweed, it can induce a, a, what we call an immediate type anaphylactic reaction, type one dangerous reaction. I never had that happen, thank God. But you want someone in there who's got some experience in emergency medicine. Uh, and that's why I think Dr. Gottschalk hired me. But I didn't know I was a core wellness coach. It took, it took an aeronautic engineer out there in Los Angeles to come in one day and I said, man, I haven't seen you, I forget his name, I haven't seen you for a long time. I came up after lunch, back to the office, and he said, yeah, I, I just was in the neighborhood I wanted to stop by. And you know this story, John, he had a bowl with tinfoil over it, and he said, uh, I don't need my allergy shots anymore. Well, I'm thinking, oh, boy, are you good, Doug, 20 of those shots and he's cured. And he said, actually, Doug, they never really helped. So all of a sudden, I'm deflated. And he said, but mom aged milk from a recipe that her mom gave her. How do you age milk? And he said, this is what it looks like. And he pulled the top off, and it looked and smelled to me like cottage cheese. You guys know it today as yogurt. Um, but he said, I keep it in the refrigerator, and I take a tablespoon of that in the morning and a tablespoon in the evening, and it's now been, what, a month? I haven't had any allergies. Thanks to the grace of these good people teaching me, I'm open. I will die not knowing at all. Okay? So will your doctor. Um, I get so much feedback from using these instead of this. And I did at a young age. I mean, here's a guy that taught me. So you know what I did? <laughs> I began telling people that there's a guy who I made friends with these allergy patients. They were wonderful. And uh, age milk, you know, came up in many conversations. And I never heard back from anyone who tried it. But then I went to a health fair at the Roosevelt Hotel there uh, in Los Angeles. And there was 10 people. And back then, you guys, they all looked like hippies. You know, they had just long hair and, and braids. And, you know, it, they, they just looked like hippies. And these were people who were the pioneers. These were the people who started the whole health movement. I was introduced to rice cakes. What's a rice cake? Um, I was introduced to yogurt, something called yogurt. Um, that's when I got it. My aeronautic engineer buddy. Oh, can this stuff help allergies? Yeah, we think so, but it helps the gut. This is bacteria. It's bacteria and you want me to eat it? See, I'm afraid of bacteria. And this is the way many doctors are today. Although we're gaining ground, give them credit. There are so many doctors who graduated with a prescription pad career and are learning. And that excites me. That excites me. Um, okay, Kathy, I'm going to send you those two books and sign them for you. Um, hey, uh, Pat. Hi, Doug. Curious about whether or not you only speak at ACIM med conferences to docs, or if you'll be speaking to the Get Your Life Back Now. Somebody knows more than I know about this. Uh, to all of us health enthusiasts, would love to hear you. John, do you know? 
Oh, no, okay. Um, well, Simon, here, I, I bet you Dr. Yu is going to be at that thing. Generally, listen, I enjoy it. And Dr. Cowden and a couple other doctors that run that have asked me for years to come there and be a moderator. Introduce, so it is, so it is doctors meeting upstairs and lay meeting downstairs, and I get to introduce all the doctors that are gonna be speaking downstairs. So I'll probably be speaking at both conferences, which means, Pat, um, sometimes the, the lectures are too technical that you give upstairs, and so we fan them out, and we uh, take the technicality out of them and make it uh, much more entertaining for the group downstairs. Uh, I like the group downstairs a lot. So, Pat, I'll meet you there. I will be there, ACIM. I do a lot of these lectures, but as I get old, I, I really want to start stopping them, but um, I can't. When I hear the stories, um, man. Uh, we had a doctor on today that we taped, John, that was at ACIM a year ago, right? That doc ocular, that optometrist. Yes, and she said, she listened to my lecture, and then John was out there with a camera going and with a microphone, uh, you know, a little label pin, a, a microphone, and uh, these doctors came clean. I mean, she was awesome, and she said, oh, yeah, yeah, fungus can grow, you know, as it starts growing through the body, it can get into the eyes and cause all sorts of, so she's studying now, she's a, uh, becoming a mycotic uh, optician. She's becoming an eye doctor who studies fungus. Changed her whole practice, she, said. she said it changed her whole practice. I mean, these are seeds. These are seeds. Um, so, uh, Pat, yes, and I'm excited to see you, Pat H. Uh, I will be there. I don't. It's after my birthday, so it's sometime in November. Um, and then in October, I'll be at the TTAC, right? The Truth About Cancer, speaking at that one, that's a big one. Uh, okay, time ran out, says SL here. Time ran out at the end of the last Facebook Live and some questions did not get answered, especially the one about urine mycotoxin screening. Is there a protocol before doing the test? Uh, okay, is there a protocol for doing your... Um, if we're looking for mycotoxins in the urine, by the way, really good question. I'm sorry I didn't get to that last time. There are obviously uh, many ways. They have new DNA tests for mold and mycotoxins. There's a lab called Real Time Labs out here that does that new DNA testing. But finding mycotoxins in your urine is another really good way to do this. Now, I don't know the answer to this, um, but I'll tell you my heart. If I were concerned that I had mycotoxins in my body and they were being excreted in my urine, that would be a good thing. They need to come out. Um, but would there be a protocol? I wouldn't stop drinking. I wouldn't stop eating bread if that's what I do every day because I'd want the test to be that accurate. Many people, before they go in for a sugar test, stop eating for three or four days or just you know eat celery or a salad for three or four days, that's gonna give you a false indication. Your blood sugar, of course, will be very low. You'll look at it and say, wow, 92, that's really cool. And then you go back to eating your sandwiches and pasta and so forth, don't do that. The, the only protocol would be to sign up for the test, get in there and take it, and then based on the results, I'm sure one of the pathologists will uh, talk to you about what it means to, to have this mycotoxin in your urine. Thank you for reminding me of that. Um, Okay, so Ben, uh, Ben, just wanting, hi Ben, just wanting your opinion on supplements from the vitamin shop. Would you say they're getting, would you say getting, they're probably, would you say they have good supplements? Uh, yeah, um, we have one out here by us and I picked up something the other day. Um, I hope you all support what I support. I mean, I buy my meat from a guy out here in Texas uh, because I really want to support his business. Uh, the, the vitamin shop was so pretty when they first built it. It still is. There's a lot of people that go in there. Um, ben, my only worry with supplements 
is some of the huge companies that sell secondhand. Um, they must buy because their business model is they've got to buy that from you for $2.50 to sell it for $20. Because they've got $17.50 of overhead. They're lights, you know, and I understand that. So some of these large box stores um, check the dates, you know, get your glasses out and check the dates on the vitamins. Um, go online, then we have the internet now. You can go on and, and check these things out. And when you can, buy local or be loyal to the company uh, and go directly to them and buy online. Um, the only question I would have is, if you can sell it at $2.50, um, when does it expire? Okay, good questions. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so this is Ruth. Uh, I love that name, Ruth. I married a Ruth. I would love to get one of your diet books shipped, but unfortunately I was told you don't ship to the UK. I watch you every day and see you talking about your books, some of which I'm interested in, but can't get them here. Kristen says, yeah, we can. People order them on our website. We're shipping books all over the UK. Um, so Ruth, maybe you don't have uh, the ability to order online. Maybe that's how we're doing it. If you don't, do me a favor. Tomorrow, call Kristen and say, I, I heard Doug mention yesterday, my name's Ruth, that's his wife's name, um, and I would like to get the books. I can't go online. Let Kristen go online and fill it out and get them off to you. We ship them every day to some really cool places. This going global on television has been amazing. Has been amazing. Thank you all. Ruth, we'll take care of that for you. Um, okay, Jim Smith, my buddy. Uh, Doug, I thought I heard you start to say something about CPAP machines. Once curious, pro or con? Could it be causing problems? Um, I'm a know the cause guy, Jim. I don't want to hear, yeah, you're snoring. Why am I snoring? Is my uvula too low? Is it hanging down? Uh, am I eating dairy at night, yogurt or ice cream or something? Dairy is mucus producing. Um, and then, okay, so let me tell you where my heart is, because I've never held back from you guys. Sometimes we use fear to sell things, and this is especially true in medicine. We are told that our heart could stop and will die without this CPAP machine. Really? We're told that statin drugs have saved two million lives. Really? Um, I just don't know if people go to bed in droves and are dying without a CPAP machine. Then I worried for 20 years since they've, I saw all these clinics open up with, you know, sleep technology and they recommend CPAP machines and man, you guys. You really got to delve. You really got to think about this. The story is you may die without this. Really? Because I'm 40 years old and I've lived every day. That's a lot of days. Yeah, but without this, you could die. Without my statin drug, you could have a heart attack. Really? Because I'm 50 years old. I haven't had a heart attack yet. Yeah, but you need my drug. Just be careful out there. That's all I can tell you. There aren't bad. There's always a few in every bunch. I'm just telling you the whole CPAP thing, thank you, has always concerned me. Because before CPAPs came on the market, we didn't see 85 people a day dying in their sleep because they had a, a breathing disorder. I always worried about them being not clean because of the respiration and all the fungi that I thought were causing people to have a huge amount of phlegm at night and nose block up and so forth. Uh, but that's, you know, in 1960, one of you can help me with this. In 1960, how many women had breast cancer? One out of 100. Along came mammograms. Now how many people, women, are diagnosed with breast cancer? All I'm saying, all I'm saying 
is be careful. And I'm telling you the truth. The year I was born in 1949, four out of five doctors smoked camels because they were good for you. Thanks, Jim. Good question. Uh, yeah, this, uh, Beth, really good point. It takes really getting sick before we look elsewhere. I look to know the cause and I'm getting much better. Just need to stick to the diet and ignore my, my fungal cravings. Man, if that isn't everybody's story. Um, you bring up a valid point. When are you going to follow this part? Well, I, you know, so far the tachycardia isn't bothering me. Uh, so far the diarrhea seems to, you know, I think I'm doing fine. I'm like that too. I'm like you guys. I'm a procrastinator. Uh, holiday time, I don't know about you guys, but I'll do this show in a few weeks. By the way, as you probably know, this is, uh, this is, September is mushroom month, and it's also prostate cancer month. Next month is breast cancer month. Um, we need to talk about that, ladies. Um, and men, we need to talk about prostate cancer. And, and I, I try and do that. What is cancer? Those of you attending, they gave me that question to answer in front of these, you know, huge audiences for the truth about cancer. Hey, Doug, what is cancer? That's my topic. Wait till you see it. Um, thank you, Beth. Can you tell me, Sylvia, good question. Can you tell me if fungus has anything to do with hand tremors? How can you get off diabetic medications carefully and with the guidance of your doctor, please? Th drug companies are smart, no matter what you think, folks. The, the brilliance is not convincing doctors you need these. The brilliance is they're dangerous to get off them. And work with a doctor. Many drugs are. Work with a doctor. Do you know what tremorogenic activity is, Sylvia? Parkinson's is kind of typical. Tremorogenic activity. You know, uh, gait differs, handshake, and so forth. Given the fact that penicillin is neurotoxic, it can do that. But there are several neurotoxic mycotoxins. Some of them grow in our air supply, up in our HVAC systems, in our homes, in our gardens, etc. Um, so if I had bad hand tremors, I'd say, okay, this is time. I'd listen to Beth. This is time. I'm going to follow Kaufman's diet for one month. Doug, you got me for a month. I'm not going to do this you know, at Halloween or Thanksgiving or Christmas, too difficult. I'm going to do it today until, you know, one month, September 5th, uh, October 5th. Uh, and I'm going to see if Doug's right. <clears throat> then I'm going to ask my doctor if he'll give me tremorigens, uh, if he'd give me Diflucan, an anti-yeast, anti-fungal medication that gets into my nerves. And I'd like, you know, these little cell phones that John turned mine off? Um, they have really good cameras now, so I'd love it if a loved one would say, okay, stand there, now hold your hand steady, okay, and film that for 20 seconds. And it's probably be more like this, right? Then in a month, you're still on the Kaufman diet, you've taken your Diflucan or another antifungal, you're taking a good probiotic, right, and uh, have someone go back and do this again. The proof as we say, is in the pudding. If this is significantly improved, you haven't cured it, but you're on the right track. To reverse neurotoxicity, as I've lectured to many of these groups, uh, takes a long time. And you always have, what, what Beth says, you always have the test, the ultimate test. 31 days, here's Sylvia. It's my birthday piece of chocolate cake, glass of red wine, the next day. Holy cow. That is the proof being in the pudding or in the cake or in the wine. It's okay to challenge. We don't call it cheating. It's okay to challenge your diet because that's how we learn. Um, once you see for two days, gosh, I'm miserable again. I forgot. I've got indigestion and everything on top of this. That was all gone when I was following the Kaufman diet. Okay, good. Oh, Debbie, good question. Is it safe to use 75% uh, 
uh, alcohol hand sanitizer. I think that's isopropyl alcohol, five to 10 times per week. Debbie, if you're a nurse or a doctor or work in a hospital, you don't have much choice. God put good bacteria all over our hands, our guts, and our eyeballs. Um, and what do we do? Remember, bacteria starts with a B, so if you're in medicine, that means bad, okay? Is there any way you can cut way down on that or dilute it so you end up with a 30% instead of a 70%? Coconut oil helps. Coconut. Yeah. So, John, these things are conducive to good health. Coconut, some, the, M, the, the uh, triglycerides, the uh, M... Uh, boy, am I tired. We had a heck of a day, didn't we? <laughs> the uh, the uh, antifungal oils in coconut um, are good to the good bacteria and, pa and kill the bad bacteria. So there are hand sanitizers um, that are good at leaving the good bacteria intact but kill the bad bacteria. Soap. I need to research Crohn's disease, says Terry, a family member's on her deathbed with all kinds of medical issues. Those are the joys. I've done so many of these. Gosh, did I get, you guys have been watching probably Facebook. Uh, man, there's some people just praising this antifungal thing. You know, there's many variations of this now, and the ego in me says, hey, that's my diet. Uh, hey, that's my research. Um, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. Somebody graciously gave it to me, and I'm sharing it. And so it's an honor to see my slides at these medical meetings reprinted of people to say, well, you know, I'm, I have my own antifungal diet because Kaufman says carrot, and that's too high on the glycemic index. So I made my, you know, the, the, the human part of me says, well, shame on you. Let me explain Falcarin. all and tell you about carrots. The real part of me smiles because... If they stay away from carrot, they'll be fine. They got the grains right. They got the alcohol right. So it's a joy knowing before I'm gone, a lot of people will have this information. Uh, yes, Crohn's, Dr. Ganum, my friend at uh, Case Western, a mycologist, the most brilliant man I've ever met. I told you he wrote that book, Antifungal Therapies. Whew. Uh, he published that they have found in, in Crohn's disease, remember it's named after a doctor first. Any disease named after a doctor has got to be due to something he didn't learn in medical training, fungus. Um, so he found fungal tissue in Crohn's patients, and that was record-breaking. Two years ago he published it, because Crohn's patients, just like every other, just like sinus, patients. here, take an antibiotic, take an antibiotic, take an antibiotic. Wait a minute, it's fungus. You're feeding the fungus with the antibiotic. So his work was pivotal. Terry, share this with family. Want to get your sleeves rolled up? Let's start juicing if she's that sick. Uh, and and uh, let's see if we can't help her get better. Good, good questions. So sorry. So lauric or lauricidin versus caprylic acid. Both coconut oil derived fatty acids, um, and uh, I don't know if they make uh, lauricidin caps. I know they make caprylic caps, but um, I have always been big. In my early days, back in the 60s, uh, 60s 70s, when I was working clinically with these doctors, I would rec that's when I first recommended caprylic acid. It's a supplement. Uh, Frank Jordan. Uh, has it. Just go on my website. The uh, um, NSC uh, company has it. I like it. I'm big on it, Connie. Thank you. Whew. Um, Doug, can you discuss hyperparathyroidism? Uh, Mary, to the extent that it's an endocrine tissue, um, the thyroid, um, what can make it go hyper or hypo? We discussed that a little earlier. Uh, it's a condition in which uh, the parathyroid gland becomes overactive, right? Produces 
too much of the hormone that it makes. Um, so what have we to lose? What have we to lose? If I had hyperparathyroidism, big word, maybe a simple fix, you're going to know in a month. Hi, Doug. Drinking, is drinking noni juice good to drink? Noni is called, Denise, uh, Merindia citrifolia. Uh, Merindia citrifolia is the most pungent berry, big berry I've ever seen. My friend uh, Richard Becker, uh, he was my first advertiser on television. And then he took over my show uh, when I left FamilyNet. Um, his, his product was noni berries. And he would bring them in. Man, they're pungent. And I loved his product of noni uh, because I had read an article that said Merindia citrifolia, noni, was 75% as effective as morphine in relieving pain. But most noni is filled with grape juice or, you know, they want to make it taste better. It's horrible tasting. Um, if you get the real Morindia citrifolia, then I think it's a great, great product. You know, I don't want to pay 17 bucks for grape juice. Okay. Um, good question, Roy. I like Roy's brain, John. If I take a calcium channel blocker for AFib, does that suggest fungus is causing the electrical missed signals? It might. This is such a good question. You heard me say earlier, Roy, that these calcium channel blockers have antifungal properties. Okay. Hmm. AFib. So here's AFib. Boom, boom. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and Roy sits on the couch watching TV at night, and he starts coughing. The ticker is, electrically, it's out of sync. Should a pacemaker fix that? Or could a diet fix that? Roy, you tell me. You're the kind of guy, you're a digger. I love that. You tell me. Let me know in a month if AFib has helped with an antifungal approach. Okay, Doug, uh, Come on, Doug. Friend of mine, his apartment flooded. It's horrible. The mold is horrible already. His dogs are sick. Ah, he's not feeling well. I try and give him this link and try and take some activated charcoal capsules right away, coconut oil for the dogs, but I just don't know where to completely begin, except he needs to get out. Belinda, I have had to tell people to leave multi-million dollar homes in Los Angeles. Um, you can imagine how they balk. But all it took was me walking into one of them. Whoo, did this flood? We had a little roof leak, but it's okay uh, because we cleaned the carpets they were soaking wet. You know, Belinda, you're there. Love them, express that, and uh, just say it's because I really care for you that I need to tell you, you need another place. Better yet, I don't know who this person is, um, if this were a brother or sister, take them up to 7,000 feet, up to the mountains. Spend four or five days with them up there, with the dogs. Watch. Men need to observe, right? Women can reason things so much, or my wife reasons things so much better than me. That's a broad statement. Men need to observe. Holy cow, Belinda. I feel great up here. I haven't felt this good in months. Then he'll get it. Men are a little slower to pick it up. Um, thank you for caring for him. Hey, uh, Jim. Okay, Doug Gale at Dr. O'Hara has said for me to take one in the morning and two at bedtime. Will the psyllium at bedtime interfere with probiotic? No. Psyllium, okay, here's the way I do it. After dinner, I take a couple of Dr. O'Hara's probiotics. Right before I go to bed, that might be around 9, 9.30, is when I shake up the psyllium and shoot it down. Give those probiotics a time to seed, to plant in the intestine, a few hours. Okay, another hypothyroid. And can't stay, uh, and can't deal and stay warm in the winter or cool. See, Cindy, have you tried the antifungal approach? You can read 700 books on Amazon right now on thyroid. Everybody's got the answer. But I don't think anybody has the answer. Why does this go wrong so often? Because it's tiny? Because it's right here near where we swallow mycotoxins? Because it's right there where we inhale? It's right in our face, our throat? I don't know. 
Challenge it. Challenge it, all of you. Debbie says, my brother was in the hospital, pneumonia, bleeding bowels. I asked my niece to ask the doctors to check him for fungus. He has bad toenail fungus. The doctor told her that he would have a rash and a fever if he had fungus, so he wouldn't check him. Okay. Wow. Debbie, I'm sorry. Um, that's kind of what I read this more, or earlier this afternoon as I introduced this. He would have a rash and a fever. Vaginal yeast? A rash and a fever? Toenail? Onychomycosis. Toenail fungus? A rash and a fever? He does have fungus. It's growing on his toenails. Is it trying to get out of his body through his toenails? Rick. Dr. Tulio Simoncini, who I discovered through you, exactly how safe is the inhalation of sodium bicarbonate through nebulizing long, long term? Richard, thank you. I don't know. Uh, I interviewed Dr. Tulio Simoncini. He wrote a book. Obviously, I wanted to have him on my show. I have the book here somewhere. Uh, it was called, uh, there it is, Cancer is a Fungus. And he signed it off for me many years ago. I don't know. I don't know with upsetting the acid alkaline balance or the sodium potassium pump, I don't know how safe it is. Um, I wish I had more information. I don't. Lost 130 pounds, Ida says, off all medications, blood pressure and metformin. Still battling monthly yeast infections. That can help. What can help that, please? You lost 130 pounds and now you're off medications, but you battle a point-specific yeast. If I were you, I would talk to my doctor about inserting one or two Dr. O'Hara's living probiotics vaginally before bed in the evening. Wear a pad um, and see if that doesn't clear it up, uh, point specific clear it up. Looks like everything else has really done well. Still vaginal yeast infections. And then I must ask this, and I don't want an answer. Did you know we can pass this back and forth? Okay. Um, so use a barrier of some kind if that. Uh, potential exists. I was diagnosed with valley fever in December. Since I've been compli uh, having complications, been hospitalized three times a year. Uh, fungus in my lungs, got out of the hospital two weeks ago, my kidney swollen. Irma, um, I don't think, look, valley fever, coccidioideomycosis, val or valley fever is um, is a condition that we inhale the fungus and it disseminates quickly from our lungs. Um, and it isn't a one week fix. Serious, uh, John's brother-in-law died of it a few years ago. He was in those mountains, clouds of dust that rolled through Arizona. It's endemic to Southern California, New Mexico, Arizona, and so forth. You gotta be on the diet. You gotta rotate these antifungals Irma, they don't know much about it. I hope you read our literature on this. I think it could really help. Okay, so uh, thanks, Doug, for answering my question. You were very close to pronouncing my name correctly. I did get the NSC, 100 milligram, had hepatitis B as a child, took a lot of antibiotics in my 20s and 30s. Also through the past 10 years, have been living in a very clean lifestyle. Gluten's grain, sugar's gone, boom. Detox quality supplements, including bentonite clay. Good for you. A lot of mycotoxins in my system. How do I know because of the many systemic symptoms? Question, should I take it every day? It being beta-glucan, okay. Should I take it every day? And if so, how many pills? I weigh 150 pounds. Should I be concerned about my liver? Is there anything else you would suggest? Wow, uh, lots of antibiotics in your youth. Okay, uh, look. The diet is imperative. No sense in taking anything if you're going to keep feeding the yeast. You already know that. You've really cleaned up your diet. I would go for rotating. Find a doctor who will understand what you have. The, the past history of antibiotic in, intake is incredible. I have, still have a lot of mycotoxins in my system. Only fungus makes mycotoxins, so you have a fungal condition. Rotate antifungals. Two weeks on Diflucan, 100 milligrams a day off, two weeks on Sporinox, 100 milligrams twice a day, off. 
You have to keep hitting this stuff, guys. It, it grows back so quickly and it makes your life miserable. Uh, thank you all. I enjoyed this. I'll see you Tuesday. Love a friend by sending him this video. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think John went well. Okay, so Kathy and Tony get the books.